with its revolutionary format. My name is Jan Gustafsson. I'm delighted to be joined yet again by International Master Ivanka Hauska. Ivanka, how are you today? I'm fine. It's absolutely wonderful to be here in the studio in Berlin, commenting on this incredibly exciting tournament because it is day two, as you mentioned. And yesterday we saw the two youngsters, Nordibek Abdusatorov and Gukesh, power past their rivals to get to the next stage in the champions bracket. And let's have a recap of what happened. The first day of the Asia and Oceania qualifier saw Indian number two Vidit take on 18 year old superstar Nordibek Abdusatorov. Vidit looked like he was putting Abdusatorov under some pressure. But with some excellent defensive moves, Abdusatorov turned the game around. In game two, Vidit tried to break down Abdusatorov's defenses, but to no avail. In the second match of the day, 16 year old project Gukesh from India faced his experienced counterpart, Ju Yang Yi. But Gukesh had the better end with some very accurate calculation. He managed to emerge with an extra might and win. In the second game, Gukesh played very, very pragmatically and was never in any trouble in the match victory. This is the Armageddon Championship Series. We just saw the highlights. This is the second of four qualifiers. The first one, the Americas, has already been played. And the second one is the one running now. Asia and Oceania, my favorite word. Europe and Africa are also coming up. Let's have a look at what else is in store? There's the Women's Week, appearing on your screen any moment. Eight players per event, 32 total. <sighs> Couldn't be more excited. Absolutely, because we have the finest minds in the game competing fiercely for the chance to enter the grand finale and win the Armageddon Championship title. All events are going to be broadcast here from the World Chess Club Berlin on Unter den Linden Strasse. That's what it's called. Let's meet our players in the Asia and Oceania qualifier. We've seen four of them in action today, yesterday and today as well. Ivanka, tell us all about the players. Yeah, I mean, take a look at some of these names. We have Daniel Dubov, who will be playing today, 2802, and former world champion Vladimir Kramnik, as well as Kartikeyan uh, Morali, who qualified online, actually, as well as Param Maxudlu. So, such exciting players. Yeah, the online qualifier, very strong player in his own right. And we have to mention one of the partners, IT.com, the official partner. It's a domain registry like no other. It provides a platform for anyone to create innovative domains and effectively showcase their online presence. Don't miss this opportunity. Visit IT.com today and create your unique online image. In case you've always wondered how this Armageddon Championship Series works, we have all the info for you. It's what they call a double elimination, which I always struggled with, but it's not that tough. It's not that tough. You lose two matches, you're out. You that's don't it. lose two matches, you're not out. Yes, that's exactly right. And uh, now we can see there are some people in the lower brackets, Vidit Gujarati and Yu Yang Yi. They're both on their last remaining lives. And Nordibek Abdusatorov and Gukesh made it through to the winner's bracket. Well, we'll find out today who goes next, gets knocked down and who continues forward. Because first up is Kartiki and Morali against Param Magsudlu. Yeah, we're very close to the beginning of the action there. We see the two players already seated at the board. So let's learn a little more about this matchup. Yeah, and uh, there we have Kartikian against Param Mag Sudlu from Iran. And uh, taking a look at, uh, let's have a look at Kartikian. Param is still studying the night there. Just uh, 24 years old, became a grandmaster at 16 years old, two time national champion, and learns the piano and the flute. 
Oof, Let's... that's amazing. Also the best puzzle solver in all of India, you told me. That's right, and let's hear more from the man himself. I'm Kartin Murli, Grandmaster from India. I'm 23 years of age and I've been playing chess for the past 15 years. My father had a surgery when I was six years old and we used to play chess, checkers, carom, all sorts of boards. And I got interested in chess and I continued professionally then. Okay, there was a moment where I met Anand in 2006. I was one of the participants where he gave the simul and that inspired me to take chess as a profession. I would say I am an aggressive player, tactical. I would like to calculate well. To become a successful chess player, I practiced almost 12 hours a day. And I think that is my biggest strength, which is my hard work, my focus, and my dedication. The best chess moments in my career is beating Maxim Machir Lagrav in Gibraltar 2019. It is so special because I came second in the prestigious tournament. So my wife gets angry at me whenever I see only chess. So it's not kind of easy, but I'm trying to manage it. Let's get to meet his opponent, Parham Masood Lu, 22 years old from Iran. That feels like he's been around forever. Grandmaster at 16 years old, three-time Iranian champion, former world junior champion, played in the prestigious Tata Steel Tournament this year with a very, very strong showing. This guy is about to break into the absolute top. And uh, let's hear from Param Maxudlu. I am Param Maxudlu, number one chess player of Iran. I started chess when I was about 10. I am playing uh, for 13 years. And firstly, I learned chess from my father. My style is just playing very sharp and uh, very aggressive. I want to win or lose, it doesn't matter for me. I just want to play fighting chess, uh, which chess fans love it. I'm just super confident uh, all the time and whenever I get bad position over the board, I don't think in a negative way. I just think that it's good position, it's fighting position and I can play very good and win the games. I think anyone who wins tournament, which is 11 rounds and you win in 10 rounds, it's just very special. I think for anyone it's like this because it shows that you could uh, like handicap one game to the tournament and still win the tournament. I just make balance between my friends, my family, uh, the time to spare with them. And also with chess and all the things with chess, I think I can balance all this. So that's why I'm improving in my life. Param and I have so much in common. We're about to start the very first match. But before that, let's have a look at the format. Two blitz games, three minutes plus two seconds. If it's tight 1-1, one, one. it's Armageddon, five versus four. Definitely have the prize fund of 50,000 uh, euros. And first prize, 18,000 euros. And if it gets to Armageddon, this is our favorite, as Jan mentioned. White gets five minutes on the clock, but is in a must-win situation. Black gets four minutes and gets draw odds. And I can see the clock ticking down. And there we see a very important person in the room, Tanya Karoli. She's an international arbiter since 2000. 2016 and she will be monitoring the play very very closely eight seconds the players are getting ready they are focused Kartikian with the white pieces both players Welcome everyone to this live stream where we have Kartikeyan playing with the white pieces against Parham Maksudlu and we have the Alekhine defense on the board. Wow! And Kartikeyan has played it very simple and straightforward. He's pushed the pawn. The bishop has come out. But choosing the Alekhine was quite a bold decision by Parham Maksudlu. And you can see that he has managed to throw off Kartikeyan because he's taking a lot of time. He's not playing his moves quickly and I think he's being put under some pressure here. Let's see how he reacts. He plays his pawn to h3 and Parham doesn't take it. He moves his bishop back to h5. 
we can also get the chessboard here so that you can follow the game uh, and we can make some analysis there we have it so e4 knight f6 and he pushed the knight knight d5 pawn to d4 d6 knight comes out to f3 bishop g4 he has pinned the knight and then comes h3 bishop h5 bishop e2 played e6 and shot castle so Kartikeyan has a very solid edge in the position and uh, he has managed to sort of castle it, brought his pieces out and maybe later on he can push his pawn to g4 if needed. But for now, very solid. Maybe you can push c4, kick this knight away. But what is a bit worrying right now is the time that is being taken by Kartikeyan. He is currently down to two minutes five seconds and he's bishop e7 played and i think he'll go for c4 yeah he plays his pawn to c4 knight to b6 karthikian very cool and calm here i wonder how he does it but now there's a threat to take on f3 bishop f3 and take the pawn on c4 so very solid he goes knight c3 ah karthikian is smart because if he takes takes and knight c4 Guys in the chat, do you see the move that's coming in for white? Hello guys, everyone in the chat. If bishop f3, bishop f3, knight c4, what's the problem? Yes, bishop b7, Akshaj Patil, very good. Shaibi Binoj, not bishop b2, but bishop b7, absolutely right. So he goes short castles and then is bishop e3 already played? Yeah, he plays his bishop to e3. No, the, the watch, Saurabh, is actually provided by the organizers themselves for the heart rate. And so that is allowed here. So bishop e3, white has very solid space in the position. And I think Parham is the one who's thinking a lot now. He's gone down on time. He has 1 minute 37 seconds left. So he goes knight d7. And now Karthikeyan takes. Pawn takes. And plays his pawn to b3. Very solid. Very nice play by uh, Karthi. Let's see how Parham manages to continue here. His position is pretty, pretty dismal, you can say. I mean, white's moves are very easy. You go queen d2, you put your rook on c1, the other rook comes to d1, maybe the rook can also come to e1. He goes knight f6, but this is blitz chess and you have almost just a minute left. So, you have, I mean, uh, while this is a good edge for white, it cannot be decisive. He plays his rook to c8. Oof. Now a very interesting idea can be to go g4, bishop g6 and then knight h4. That could be a very interesting idea here, trying to win this bishop. But let's see what Karthikeyan does. He plays 1 minute 16 seconds for him. He's at a heart rate of 104. Parham Muksudlu at 127. Rookie 1 played. Just getting the rook. To the semi-open file here. Jay Kishan says, Sagar Bhai, Samai said something special was about to come in April. Nothing yet. Please hint us. Uh, well, I also thought he was going to stream from April 1st. But that turned out to be an April Fool. Uh, well, he's played a6 and pawn to d5 played. Takes and he's taken back with the pawn. Maybe better was perhaps to take here or to even make this intermediate move, hitting the knight and then taking here. But Karthikian takes with the pawn and now maybe Parham has some weaknesses to aim at. The knight on c3 is slightly soft. He can go rook e8 now. Yes, he plays his rook to e8. The queen moves in to the central square. But now this, look at this idea. You can put your knight from d7 to c5 or e5 or you can put your this knight goes here bishop f6 can be an idea he goes knight d7 good move 
and knight to e4 played here by Kartikeyan. He's looking at some ideas here with his queen knight. This can turn into an attack also. Notice that this knight is slightly loose on b6. So rook takes c1 played by Parham. Rook takes c1 and plays his bishop back to g6 attacking the knight. Now the threat could be to take, take and move this bishop away somehow. Bishop g5 unleash the attack on the uh, knight. But okay, not bishop g5 because there is bishop takes g5. But what did he do? Knight g3 played by Karthike and 18 seconds for Parham Maksudlu. He plays his knight to c5. Can we go b4 and kick this knight and then attack here? Maybe the knight would then settle on the a4 square. So he goes queen d2 and then knight. It's Parham Maksudlu's move. No, he hasn't made his move. Yeah, he plays his queen to d2. Both players down to 15 seconds. The knight comes back to d7. And maybe Karthikian can just push the knight away. Yes, he pushes it away. B4. The knight has to move. Parham down to 7 seconds. Wow. Look at his heart rate. 140. Karthikian at 124. Knight jumps to A4. And now maybe Bishop D1. Yes, he plays it. Bishop D1 hits the knight. The knight has to go back. Bishop B3. That was a nice maneuver. H6. A4. Both players will now try not to blunder something big. White clearly better, has more space, knight to d7, queen comes up, maybe the queen wants to enter here, then attack this pawn, he goes bishop f8, Karthikeyan moves in, queen to a7 played, and now queen to b8, he takes the queen, rook takes b8, the rook enters on c7, knight to e5, takes here, I think this is completely winning, bishop a7 and take on b7, Karthikeyan has 6 seconds left, he needs to make his move, yes he plays it, he finds the move, Great move. No, he doesn't find it. He plays bishop b6. Bishop b6, but he blunders the pawn on b4. He completely missed that. He completely missed that. That, that pawn was hanging. And now here, Parham Maksudlu is two pawns up. Actually, one pawn up. But this is only two results possible. Parham is the one who is now pressing for a win. It was a big blunder by Karthike and he missed that. But will he be able to hold a draw here? I think it's very difficult, but not impossible. And Parham trades the bishops. Rook d6, check. King h2, oh, he blunders the f2 pawn. That's not good news. That's not good news. And now rook d7, king comes up. g4. Knight to e4 played. Is there any hope for Karthikeyan? Doesn't look likely. He's two pawns down. King to g2. There was a fork here. You couldn't have taken there. Knight e6. Knight f5. h5 played. Knight f4. King here. The rook moves away. Pawn takes. Pawn takes. Rook c4. King g3. Rook c3. King f2. He brings his knight back. This is not easy. This is not easy. But, you know. Ah, knight takes g5. Just No, he goes back. Well, he could have taken on g5. Knight, d5, knight g5 and Karthikeyan resigns there. Parham Maksudlu wins. And that's what Karthikeyan said. I should not have played my bishop to b6 here. I should have played bishop a7 and then the rook had to move and rook b7. It all crumbled down in just one move. And uh, yeah, that was a big, big miss for Karthikeyan. Let's go back to our commentators in the studio, Jan Gustafsson and Yovanka Huska position but then completely lost the threat within a couple of moves gave up his queenside pawns and Parham never looked back let's have a look at some of the highlights here we see the opening the queen hitting the knight he's in full control I mean it, look at his position it looks absolutely dominant and Parham is just struggling for a plan he's just shuffling the knights backwards and forwards and there we see some nice knight maneuvers and uh, it looked great for Kartikian here. Yeah, but he didn't find a way to break 
the black defenses early on and he also burned a lot of time in the later when concrete calculation was needed after he invaded there with his queen exchanged the queens and now moved the rook forward here on the next move i'm not sure if we're gonna see it here he could have taken and then moved his bishop to the a7 square one square further attacking the rook on b8 and if that rook moves he could have taken the pawn say he loses a crucial tempo with this bishop move yeah. and now his pawn started falling and he went on to lose the game yeah this is the turning that. this is the turning point and uh, there you see the, the initiative shifts over to black Woo. So Farah Masudlu, the favorite in this matchup, here we can see him converting the final moment. Yeah, there we see it and Bond how effortlessly he makes a look and the handshake. And Params Matsudlu wins with the black pieces. What a fight, I have to say. It was very unexpected. And seconds now ticking down. Katakian really needs to shake off that disappointment that he will be feeling because he knew that he had a chance to perhaps win this game and he messed it up. And now Para with the white pieces just has to hold the fort. And we know Param, he's an exceptionally strong player. It will be very easy for him, I think. Yeah, the one drawback he could have is his fighting style. I don't think he's used to crying the game out like we've seen Gukesh do yesterday. He always wants excitement, he said in his video. Win or lose, doesn't matter as long as it's fighting. But of course, he is the favorite in this matchup. Kartikeyan will be a bit in his head because of the mistakes in the last game. So recover so quickly now, literally one minute to regain his composure here. I don't like his chances. Let's see. And Light stop. Hey guys, off we go. And this is the second game, must win game for Karthik and Murli here. Let's see how he deals with all the stress that is there on his shoulders. Will he manage to beat Parham Maksudlu? So c4, knight f6, knight to c3, pawn e5. Knight f3, knight c6. We have the four knights in the English opening. e3 played. He goes bishop to b4 and now queen to c2. Okay. Bishop takes c3. Unprovoked, the bishop gives itself up. The idea is that you place your pawns on the dark square so that your other bishop is now open mm. and your bishop on f8 is no longer hemmed in. e4 played by Parham and how does Karthikeyan react he simply castles and also if you see Karthikeyan is moving quickly uh, we should keep it this way so that you know the colors uh, and the time match properly so he goes bishop to e2 and Karthikeyan goes knight d7 now this knight d7 move is a multi-purpose move. You can bring your knight to c5. From c5 it can go to e6, later to f4. Also, there are ideas of opening up the position with f5. And Parham now plays d4. Wow, that is a very interesting move. Karthikeyan doesn't even touch the pawn. He says to Parham, if you want to take, be my guest, you will be left with two isolated pawns doubled pawns so b6 played and now white simply castles it out guys do you think kartikeyan can make a comeback here what are your thoughts here queen after castles Karthikeyan is thinking maybe he's played his move queen to e7. Yes, he's played it. So right now there are no threats. Taking means cd4. The pawn on e4 is defended. The knight is also defending the pawn. Parham Maksudlu needs to figure a way out to activate his bishops. One idea could be to activate his bishop from this diagonal because the c1 bishop right now does look open but it doesn't have good squares. Rookie one is a very, very professional move. The idea now is to just drop the bishop back and defend the rook, that pawn. But there's one thing which you should always remember that if a rook is standing opposite the queen, 
it can lead to a discovered attack at any point so knight f6 played here and he's put his bishop on a3 wow bishop to a3 the idea is clear you want to play c5 and i think a very decent move can be bishop g4 to put pressure on the d4 point rakshit singh says yes he can make a comeback so does mohammed shoaib says e takes d4 was played this is not a good move because now there is a very nice move that he can play the main point is that after take take i think kartikeyan wanted to do this and he had seen that if bishop d3 is played he can move his queen here but what he has completely missed is the move e5 what a fascinating move here and look at this after knight e5 the point is very simple you take on e5 and now you can't take with the pawn because the queen is hanging so you must take with the queen and what does maksudlu do he goes bishop to f3 hitting the queen hitting the rook and the queen here and it is almost game over now kartikeyan plays bishop f5 he hits the queen and he says what are you planning to do and now we reach a position where parham has only moved queen c1 if he plays queen c1 he's better all other moves are better for kartikeyan wow what a complicated position why is queen c1 better and why is queen d1 not working by the way just so that you know you cannot really take on a8 or e5 let's say you take on e5 that would not be great because i'll take on c2 and then i'll take your rook here if you take my rook so that's why queen d1 played but that is a mistake because of bishop e4 and kartikeyan finds it he finds it and he is better now the thing which was missed here was that if he had played queen c1 and now if bishop e4 was played then after bishop e4 knight e4 there is the move f3 and this is a very important little nuance because in the game after this bishop e4 bishop e4 knight e4 if you were to play f3 there is this move knight c3 hitting the queen and that's why the queen had to be on c1 and this was not found by maksudlu within the limited amount of time he has and now it is kartikeyan who is back in the driver seat that's why he's known as one of the best solvers out there abhijit says white lost the d1 move black is equalizing well abhijit not just equalizing he's in fact clearly better now let's see if he manages to convert this maksudlu has played his queen to c2 and he's attacking here but here's another beautiful move that can be played d3 sacrificing the pawn so that then he can bring his rook no he brings his rook directly which is also fine which is also a good move no problems there so great chess by kartik and murli c takes d4 played do you want to take here because uh yeah i think taking here is great you keep an eye here you keep an eye here yes he takes on d4 bishop b2 played and now queen d2 yes exactly great move attacking the queen and f2 and i think kartikeyan is going to make a big comeback here okay so what happened after queen d2 there was rook a c1 and now kartikeyan takes takes and knight comes back to c5 rook e2 he plays his rook to e6 this is just simple stuff here for black he can take with the pawn he takes with the knight everything is good count the number of pawns he has two extra pawns nothing to worry the c4 pawn is weak uh, the c c5 square is an outpost so this is completely winning if i played king f2 king f7 and yes very nicely played here by kartikeyan and now both players moving very quickly because there's very little time but i think 21 seconds with a 2 second increment per move is uh, easy easy stuff for kartikeyan uh, also notice parham's heart rate he is at a 100 and 
And let's see how how Karthikeyan converts this. Oh, he gives back one pawn. But he had taken the pawn on c4, so he gives back one. And now he's still two pawns up. <laughs> Look at those four pawns there. They are so strong. Which means that if this game goes Karthikeyan's way, then we will go into an Armageddon where uh, one of the sides will have the white pieces and five minutes and the other side will have black and four minutes. All those pawns are just too strong. It's time to resign for Parham. He resigns and Karthikeyan Murli wins 1-1. We go into the Armageddon. Well, what a nice game by Karthi. And also, just to show you guys that the key moment came at this point when he had to find the move. Queen to c1. Bishop f5 was such a powerful move. Queen c1 had to be played. But instead, he played queen d1, and after bishop e4 takes, there was no f3 because knight takes c3 was happening. Let's go back to our commentators in the studio, Jan Gustafsson and Yovanka Huska, and also look at a few highlight moments from the game. was missed by Parham, and now he just had to go for this hopeless endgame, which Kurt Kayan converted very smoothly. Definitely. And whoa, now we're going to go into Armageddon. Do they even get a breather? When does it start? Here we see the final stages of the last game. Yeah. Where Kartikian just pushed all his pawns forward. Param looks annoyed. I thought he said win or lose doesn't matter as long as it's fighting games. That was a fighting game. Param, but, but did you lie to us? <laughs> well, that position was like a playground for Kartikian. Just pure enjoyment. And uh, talking about pure enjoyment, that is what is in store for us. Oof. Because we are going to go and see Armageddon coming I'm up excited. shortly. And uh, here we are seeing Kartikian in the final moments. I mean, just take a look at that. The B pawn, completely unstoppable. And Param had enough and shakes hands. So Armageddon, white gets five minutes. Black gets four minutes, no extra time in these Blitz games. There were two extra seconds. Now there's no extra time. You're a veteran of the Armageddon Championship Series. Can the pieces start flying? They can. Will we see, will we see fair play? Will we see arguments? What's going to happen? Well, if we see arguments, this is why we have uh, international arbiter Tanya Carley on site. She will be reviewing all the footage and making sure no legal moves will be played. Uh, 27 Let's seconds. Go. Players are in darkness. Let's go. I like Soon how they made all these the arrangements. Starts ticking. Lighting. The stage music. will light. Up. It's beautiful. And uh, there we can see who has the white pieces. Katakian, I think it starts off with the white pieces. So he How is that determined? Is there a drawing of lots? Is it just assigned? Uh, Katakian with white has to win the game. Masud Lu with the black pieces needs to draw. Okay, let's go. Let's go. So the game starts off. We have e4 knight. Oh my god, we have the Alekhine defense once again, guys. Wow, this is very, very interesting and both players making their moves super quick because it is a very important game from time perspective. So e4. Knight f6, e5, knight d5, d4, d6, knight f3. Many moves have been played and actually this is the repeat of the first game's opening. Knight c3, castles, bishop e3. Kartikeyan is not unhappy to repeat what happened in game number one. And after rook c8, rook c1, a6, a4, knight f6, rook e1, played knight d7. And now we have the live position on the board. 4 minutes 35 seconds for Kartikian. He goes queen d2. He is in a must win situation. Maksudlu has 1 minute less on the clock but can draw the game. So that is a benefit he has. 
d5 player and the pawn pushes forward to c5. After this will be Dubo versus Kramnik. So stay tuned for that as well. And if Kartikeyan wins today, he will move to the next round along with Gukesh who beat Yu Yangi yesterday. With it had lost to Nodirbek. By the way, Nodirbek ensuring that he beats as many Indians as he can. He also beat... Um, well, yesterday he beat Anish Giri uh, and today he beat Arjun Arigaisi in the Champions Chess Tour. He is just on fire. Okay, Rook A8 and now maybe Kartikeyan is thinking he goes Knight to D2. Great move. Bishop E2 and you can take here Rook E2, Knight D2. I think White's position is definitely for choice here. Kartikeyan just deciding whether to take with the Bishop or the Queen. He takes with the Queen. And now what did he play? Knight b8. The knight may want to come to c6. Bishop f4 played. And he plays his knight to c6. g3. Oof. g3. What was the point of that move? Why did he play g3? And after g3, rook c8. Queen e3 has been played. White is slightly better. Abhijit says, Alekhine defense is one of my favorites. Lot of interesting options. Yes, Jai Kishan says, Alekhine in the tiebreaker. Yes, can't get more exciting than this. Also, the position is around equal right now. Knight b4. White is slightly better. But you will see that Black's knight is nicely placed here. White may want to make use of the d6 square for which he has the access. Maybe later on also push the pawn down the board with h4, h5, h6. And that is exactly what Kartikeyan does. He pushes his pawn to h4. He goes there. But Maksudlu seems to be ready with his plan here. Which is to break on the queen side. He can play b6 now. Did he play that? Yes, he played b6. And now Kartikeyan seems to have brought his bishop in on to d6. Which is a good move. Bishop d6 played. So bishop d6, b takes c5 played and then he has taken d takes c5. And Kartikeyan now down to 2 minutes 38 seconds. Parham has 2 minutes 13 seconds. Guys, where is this match heading to? What do you think? Do you think white can convert this knight c6 back, rook to d1? He goes queen d7, h5 pushing the pawn, h6 stopping the pawn in his tracks, queen f4 played. Well, it's heating up, it's heating up. Both sides have their trump cards. Parham wants to move his rook from f8. Maybe he wants to put it on e8 or d8. He may want to even take here, but the knight will jump in. So he takes, oh, he takes here. And now Kartikeyan has to decide whether he wants to take with the... Yeah, he takes with the pawn. He says, my knight is well placed here and it defends the pawn. The pawn on d6 is actually a big strength. And the idea can be just to double down on the c-file now. So while the position might seem around equal, it seems it's easier to play as white. I think Parham would do well to exchange of the knights. Time-wise, the situation here is... I think in Parham's favor because there, there was a difference of one minute when the game began and now it's down to just 10 seconds. Kartikian feeling the pressure because on one hand he has to ensure that he manages to sort of keep the flame going. He has to win but on the other hand he is uh, kind of he doesn't want to get worse. Look at his time. He's down on time. And he needs to make a move. He needs to make a move. By the way, really love how the jackets have been have been given to the players with their names on it. Ah, but this is not going Kartikian's way. He's thinking a bit too much. There's no increment here. And you can't think too much here. With one minute left, I think he goes knight c7. Well, his point is knight to c7. Uh, doesn't want to exchange much. Rook d8. Blunders. Blunders. Knight d5 played. 
What a brilliant move. Pawn takes rookie seven and then this hangs. Wow. And now knight e7 threatened, knight b6 threatened. What a big blunder by Parham Maksudlu. This has completely turned it around. Karthike and Murli now winning this match completely from being low on time. He now is better and you can see how Parham Maksudlu is completely immersed in his thought. He cannot believe the blunder he made. This was completely fine here. He had to move his knight. And then after knight d5, e d5, the e7 square is controlled and also the f7 pawn is defended. But the moment he moved his knight, his rook, knight takes d5 came, then rook c5 is played. But now there are many ways to win. Maybe the most easy one is knight e7 check to put the knight in there and just hassle the king. Yes, he plays the check, king f8 forced, otherwise he would lose the pawn here on f7. And now knight g6. Perhaps just making a few. Yeah, he, he goes knight e5, hits the queen. And now the queen cannot move away in a way that f7 pawn would hang. So, goes queen e8. And queen comes back to e3. Very classy move. Very classy move. Because now if the rook moves, then a7 is hanging. He goes rook c7. Because if you take here, then d1 would hang. That is possible still, but he goes d7, queen e7. And now Kartikian has only 33 seconds to win this. He needs to play faster. Kartikian, it's all about time now. You can't be really thinking so much because there's no increment. Has he forgotten? I think he's forgotten that there's no increment. In 21 moves, 21 seconds, it's impossible to win this now. Queen f4, if he wins this, that would be a miracle, I believe. Because in 19 seconds, Karthikeyan, I think he's forgotten. He's forgotten or he's gotten a bit too, bit too relaxed. Or, or just Queen F5, now both players moving quickly. The king falls. But that is already now the pieces are going to fall off. Rook E6, Queen F7, Black is making a comeback in this game. Queen F8 played, Rook D6, Knight D4 and pieces dropping. The position is around equal, but it's all about time now. Knight b6 played. Rook c1 check. King h2. Queen e1. Is that a mate? Who's checkmating whom? Queen g2. Queen e5. Rook f4. Two seconds. Suddenly, Karthikian remembers that he has very little time and he loses on time. He loses on time there. And Parham Maksud loose smiles there. What a escape 175 heartbeats per minute for Karthike and there insane stuff at the end insane stuff Whew. I think he needed to play faster there he was completely winning he was completely winning let's go back to our commentators in Berlin lost his cool you could see the pieces start flying a bit there he could no longer find good moves yeah. there's a lot of tension this game. yeah it is and you always have to remember there's no increment that is the name of the game but uh there we see some key moments cut key and in full control but take a look at his clock time one minute and 12 seconds and he plays this beautiful beautiful tactic yeah, that was very and nice Parham this couldn't is it. capture it and he realizes it now Kartikian was still very much in business there, not only with a good position, but also the clock times were about even after Parham's long thing. But then later, he just slowed down way too much. Let's have a look yeah. there with five seconds against 11. That's that is just not enough. Mission impossible. There is no way he can move. Even quickly. though Parham moved in slow motion there, it was still enough. Oh, no, I think this is actually slow motion. <laughs> there we see the players desperately trying to make a move, doesn't matter what. But the clock, it always decides who is victorious. You gotta mate before you run out of time. That's the rules of Armageddon, not that life. Is the rules. And, uh, wow, hoo, hoo, hoo. that was exciting. I love Armageddon. I feel like it's taking chess back to the streets. And there you see Param is the winner, and Kartikian is knocked down to the lower bracket. And in terms of heart rate, well, Param had, well, a quite a very high, high rate, uh, heart rate of 176. Oof, it's a new uh, record.
Look at that, 56 calories. Although I'm sure that does not really representative. The players will be feeling very shaky. And uh, Kartikian, well, his highest heart rate was 157. Let's switch to the interview with Kartikian. If he's ready already, he should have a moment to calm down. So we'll give him a little bit of a breather to recover from all of this excitement. Yeah. <laughs> and here we are with Fiona and Kartikeya. Kartik, uh, what a tough loss. It was such a crazy match going all the way to the wire, to the Armageddon. Uh, your feelings after this match? Yeah, it was pretty, I think, uh, even fight and uh, Basically, it came to uh, came down to the nerves of the player. So I felt like I played well, but uh, somehow in the army, he defended well. So I just couldn't find the f uh, finishing blow, and uh, when I th I just got panicked, and I think that's the turning point. Yeah. The time pressure. I mean, the time was ticking then. Mm -hmm. What were your your emotions in that moment during the Armageddon? I, I was just looking. For tricks and uh, especially when I played night season, I had this only trick. Uh, uh, where uh, he played rook of d8. I thought if he had played rook c8, it was just equal. Uh, and then uh, I was basically looking, looking for the tricks here. You know, in our McDonald, like you can't uh, like uh, play for. The best, but you can at least make uh, put some pressure and go for tricks. And I it worked out well, but at the end he defended very well, especially when he played rook season. I got panicked there. Yeah. Okay. Well, Kartik, thank you so much, and a commiseration. Best of luck for the next one. For now, back to the studio with Jovanka and uh, Jan. Thank you, Fiona, and it is my greatest pleasure to have here in the studio. Haram Maxidlu, wow, that was a gripping match. <laughs> it was a very tough match and I was very nervous for today mm -hmm. because okay, somehow Morel is uh, uh, lowest rated in this tournament, but uh, normally these players have a lot of motivation because they want to show they're very strong and I knew that he played very well. Mm -hmm. I was very nervous, I think I just played so bad. Okay, yesterday I wanted to play some training games to just warm up for the tournament and uh, yeah, I was playing with my friend and I knew that he's a different player mm -hmm. so I played with knight f6 okay he played e4 mm -hmm. I, so I played olive, olive yeah. and okay I didn't have any choice because I was preming in this and I won the game so I thought such a good opening to play but it was such a bad idea to play <laughs> this in blitz I think I had no move in all Positions and it was just. Well, you even repeated it in the Armageddon. Yeah, there you could have figured out E4 was coming. But I just prepared this and I didn't have any other choice. When you prepare something, you have to play it. Ah, okay. But you did have the better end for you. How was it when the pieces started flying? Do you think, come on, put the pieces on the right squares? Do you try to move them cleanly or how do you find the balance between moving so quickly? I think I was. Uh, I didn't make any mistake. I didn't drop any pieces and uh, okay I knew that if he does it it's not on purpose of course he's also nervous and I saw that I'm up on the clock so I'm somehow confident with my uh, uh, time control in uh, in few seconds so I was sure that I can flag him. <laughs> you managed. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Farhan. Thank you. We'll get to the next match. Yeah, it's, it's very bad that I couldn't manage to uh, make at least draw in second game because I think at the moment that he blundered e5, it's completely winning for me. Because I think after bishop f5, I can just play queen c1, just protecting everything and. Uh, and and not letting him to play bishop before on knight e4 because if he plays, I take and play f3. Right. Uh -huh. And I'm just completely winning and I played some very bad moves and got this winning yeah. position. Thank what you. What to very do? Much. Get some rest. Yes. We gotta move to Mr. Dubov and Kramnik Parham Masulu. Thank you so yes. much. See you later. See you. Bye -bye. <laughs> Thank you.
थैंक यू नल फॉर योर सुपर चैट्स बिग फैन शाउट आउट प्लीज एंड नल थैंक यू सो मच नेक्स्ट अप इज डैनियल डूबो वर्सेस व्लादिमीर क्रेमनिक द क्लैश ऑफ जनरेशंस एंड टू क्लासी प्लेयर्स फ्रॉम रशिया दीज आर गोइंग टू बी amazing and it's, it's time to mention one of our partners the fide online arena which hosts rated tournaments and games 24 hours per day join the arena and you'll get a fide id profile on fide.com access to pro chess community official online ratings and titles recognized by international chess federation prize money tournaments much more play official games at chessarena.com and we're back with the action here in the asia oceania qualifier where we have maybe the most anticipated match of this first round between Daniel Dubov and Vladimir Kramnik and uh, there we can see some impressive stats from Daniel became a grandmaster at 15 years old has a blitz rating of 2802 number 7 in the world and also was world rapid chess champion in 2018 has a reputation as the most creative chess player uh, how do you around. measure that like most pawn sacrifice in the opening <laughs> daniel always good for entertaining chess yes and uh, let's hear more about daniel from the man himself My name is Daniel Dubov. I'm 26. I'm grandmaster from Russia, and I've spent about 20 years of my life playing chess. Both my father and grandfather were pretty decent chess players. So I think being a kid, I saw them playing once, and asked my father to uh, to teach me. I think he he got tired of me, so he brought me to the chess club. And this is more or less how it started. People seem to think that my style is a very aggressive one, and to some extent, I think it's true. So it really depends. But if you use three three adjectives, it would be brave, stupid. maybe unique as well my most memorable moments are not related to my best achievements if i need to share one let's say i won a brilliant game in european team championship against rasmus wana and it helped russian team to save the match and then eventually we went on to win the tournament once again i don't i don't remember the day we won the tournament but i remember the day i won a brilliant game and i would say my main priority is the living the life and then secondly i have chess where i'm a professional i mean i try to be good i try to win all the tournaments i play but still it's uh, much more important to keep yourself entertained living the life a man who's entertained has plenty is his opponent vladimir kramnik the legend 47 years old the 14th world champion who defeated garry kasparov in the year 2000 has some other accomplishments to his name in the manila 92 olympiad he wasn't even a grandmaster yet but scored eight and a half points out of nine if memory serves yep. let's hear more from Cam- kramnik on kramnik I'm Vladimir Kramnik, grandmaster, former world chess champion, 47 years old, had a very long chess career, I've taught uh, professional chess since 2019. My father taught me chess when I was 5, then I fell in love with it and uh, here am I a professional chess player. Nowadays I'm not playing playing professional chess so nowadays I can say that chess is my passion and it's my hobby. As the former world chess champion famous Robert James Fischer have said once there is a winning style and losing style. I'm more concentrating on the level of my chess than the style of it. Definitely the most memorable moment for me is my world championship match against Garry Kasparov, the 13th world chess champion in London 2000. I managed to win it and to become the 14th uh, world champion. I think the most important skills to be on the very top of anything you do in chess in particular is to strengthen your character day after day. Yeah. Vladimir Kramnik, a true icon of the game and we are just under a minute away from this huge match up Daniel Dubov against Vladimir Kramnik. I don't know who I think is going to win. I mean both so players. So hard to say. Daniel, of course the more active player nowadays, but don't be fooled if Kramnik is saying he no longer plays professional chess. He's still incredibly good. He doesn't play classical chess anymore with the 2 hours 
but in Rapid and Blitz, even now, he has some tremendous results. So I don't know who to pick. I don't know either. I think it's going to be all about the handling of the clock in this one. And Daniel Dubov, one of the most creative players around. He loves to sacrifice pawns and play very tricky, unconventional chess. And Kramnik, well, he will probably try to play as solidly as he can when he has the black pieces. And we are seconds away from the beginning. There you go. Handshake. Okay, guys, off we go. And it's going to be a cracker of an encounter between Vladimir Kramnik and Daniel Dubov. And they have started off with the Sicilian e4, c5, knight f3, d6, d4, cd4, knight d4. And we have the knight or bishop g5 line, f4, bishop e7, queen e2 played. And a huge blunder it seems to me here bishop h4 allowing knight e4 and here's the point that if you take bishop e7 there is in between knight takes c3 bishop takes d8 knight takes e2 and the queen is attacked and that is the reason why he took here but after check g3 bishop comes back black is just one pawn up long castle dubo is like i don't care that's fine. I can still fight on because this is blitz chess. But Kramnik has also castled here. And now Dubo will go all out with g4, g5. Three minutes for Dubo. He's not even thinking much. He's playing at a super fast pace. What an exciting pairing, says Siddharth Ranadev. Jai Rajgor says, Dubo, come on. And he goes g4 and Kramnik hits the center with d5. It's not so easy to scare the world champion, you know, with some attack. Knight goes to g3. The knight comes out to c6. And now the knight moves back once again. So white's idea is to push h4 and then go for g5. Try to open up some lines against the black king. Technically, in a classical game, this is already a resignable position here. But when you are playing blitz chess, it can go either way. Kramnik goes queen to c7, a useful move, hitting the pawn on f4. And he goes queen d2, defending that pawn. So Daniel Dubov clearly uh, struggling here. And that one move blunder that he made has helped Kramnik. By the way, we must mention that Kramnik is also playing the Champions Chess Tour. And he managed to win both his rounds, if I'm not mistaken. He is in tremendous form right now. So King B1 played by Dubov. And he goes Rook A C8. Pawn to G5. Kramnik takes knight takes has occurred and now vladimir thinking he takes the knight on g5 white's disadvantage lowering down a bit because you can see that now this black king looks slightly more exposed knight comes to e5 a good move because the knight can jump back to g6 also there can be ideas of knight f3 Can we go simply h4, h5 in the position? That looks strong. But Dubov, I guess, is deciding against... His, he goes knight h5. He has two minutes left. Both the players actually playing super quick here. Knight h5 is a good move. So now you are looking at the g7 pawn. Harsh Dide says, is this heart, heartbeat thing taken from you? Not really. I think we, we did it in, in the death matches, but and also at Tata Steel. But I think uh, it's something that was done even before us as well. So we are all, you know, using ideas from each other and trying to improve chess broadcasting in general. Queen F2 played, hitting the knight here. And now Queen C5. Oh, classy move. Because if you take, then there is Queen takes C2. Followed by queen c1 checkmate. Just have a look at this. Takes, takes, king here. Check, take and mate. 
So that's the reason why he played queen g2 and now the knight came to h4, queen came back to d2 and pawn moves up to e5. Kramnik has one minute on the clock, heart rate of 139. Dubo has two minutes on the clock, but his heart is beating super quick, 155. Bishop d3 played and Vladimir pushes the pawn to e4, but not a good move now because knight f6 check is coming up. Dubo, you can see there, he already can sense it that there is a check somewhere here. A better move here would have been to go back with your knight to g6, but e4 was very risky. And now knight f6 check. If you don't take, then your bishop is hanging. But if you were to take here, g takes f6, then after g f6, threatening queen g5 and queen h6, this looks very scary. You have to find some accurate moves like king h7 and so on. So let's see if Dubo manages to find knight f6 check or not. His heart rate has moved to 170 beats per minute and he finds it. Knight f6 check, king h8 instantly played, but now knight d7 is just hanging and Kramnik has missed that move completely and is now totally lost it's time to resign queen c6 knight f8 is hanging dubov takes it ed queen d3 and after takes queen h3 the knight is hanging from a completely winning position this has transformed into a lost position for kramnik in just A couple of moves. Huge blunder. B3, he goes queen e4. I don't think there are any more twists left here. And Kramnik will have to win with the white pieces. Not an impossible task, but it's going to be very tough. Rook g1. King moves to g8. And now Rook g4. Hitting the queen and the knight. Queen e2. And he takes here. Wow, well calculated. Giving back the rook. And just saying that there's no way to stop this mate. If you play f6, I have g6 and resignation by Kramnik. Dubo wins the game. And uh, Vladimir Kramnik has lost this battle. And now we move to the second game very soon. But for now, Daniel Dubo beats Kramnik after blundering out of the opening. And Kramnik having a clearly better position. Let's go back to our commentators in Berlin and hear from them. There we see that moment. Knight six check. He has to take good or bad. So he moves the king away, and boom! Knight takes the bishop, attacks the queen and the rook, and it's all over. And Dubov's gamble pays off big time. Well. Big players make big time moves and there we see Knight taking the rook and there's just nothing to be done. There's no way that Kramnik could save that game. Uh, don't, don't give a rook is pretty good. Rule of thumb in chess middle games. Yeah, tough for Kramnik there, already great yeah. position. Now we'll have to regain his composure very, very quickly. But he is cold blooded normally. He is called uh, Big Vlad and he also was the former world champion and highly experienced in these Armageddon formats. And here we can see the close of the game where Kramnik actually regains some of his material, but that doesn't matter because there's just no way that he can prevent the checkmate arriving on the H8 square. Ooh, well, he has less than 50 seconds to get over that devastating blunder. He has the white pieces. He's now in a must-win situation if he wants to take the match to Armageddon. One of the things I have to say is that Dubov is a very creative player. And I don't think it's in his repertoire to play in a very solid fashion. Ah, I think he can. 
do that. Of course, he's very creative, but if you see him play in like the world, Blitz Championships, World Rapid Championships, he's not above taking very pragmatic decisions, making a draw here and there to secure a good placement. He does know what the score is. And it's on Kramnik to yeah. try to mix it now. And 11 seconds. Players still chatting. are chatting. Well, enough of the chit chat. Warfare. Get on. Okay, guys, let's go. The game has begun and E4 by Kramnik. And I think he'll go for his favorite Italian opening. That is something that he has great expertise in and was one of the first players to place complete faith in this opening when everyone was playing the Rui Lopez. A3 played by Vladimir, um, which was just to make a square for the bishop after knight a5 is played so that the bishop can jump back to a2. Dubov taking his time here, trying to figure out in which way he wants to continue. Does he want to play knight a5, bishop a2, c5? He goes bishop e6, knight d2, takes on c4. Knight takes c4, a5, c3 played. And look at the time advantage that Kramnik has. He has close to a minute extra on the clock. Rook e8 played here. Now maybe you want to just push the pawn to d4. He goes bishop to g5. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Knight d7 played, offering a trade of bishops. Kramnik happy to trade down. And now queen takes or rook takes, what do you do? I think queen takes makes sense. He takes with the queen. And white has a small edge because of the ability of playing d4 and gaining more space. So if you look at the center, white has more space. Black pawns are on e5 and d6. So you know, that's the reason why white is slightly better. But knight f6 is played by Dubov and he's asking Kramnik, what do you want to do? Vladimir plays his queen to b3 and attacks the pawn on b7. Maybe you want to just play b6 here. b6, maybe there is stroke d1 and small edge to white. But there is this move a4 and you actually tempt him to take here and then queen d7 with the idea of playing rook e b8 did he find it no he plays b6 which is a more human way to play but a4 was a strong move and this is a great move takes queen d7 with the idea to trap and you can't really escape so easily so he went b6 and now kramnik thinking here Yeah, queen c2 played. And now he defends his pawn on e4. He wants to get his rook to d1. Nagging edge for Kramnik. Just the kind of position he needs in a must-win situation. Because now Dubov is low on time. He has 30 seconds less. Also, the position is not so easy for black to unravel. Look, if you decide to play EDCD and pick up this pawn on E4, that's not going to work out because I can play D5 first, kick this knight away. The knight doesn't have too many great squares to go to. Let's imagine you go back to B8, then I go knight D4. Now my knight can come to F5, to C6, I can push F3 and it's completely winning. So. He goes rook a d8 now and with 1 minute 5 seconds left, h3 by Kramnik. He's being very pragmatic here. He's saying that, look, I know that it's not so easy to make progress. So let me quickly make some moves and push Daniel Dubo even further down on the clock. Bring this rook in the center. Very logical chess. And now g6. Now this, this is a move that you don't make with great pleasure because you have softened up your queen side a bit, king side a bit. H6 pawn is slightly weakened. And what is Kramnik going to do here? He knows that he's better. 
that's why he's the world champion you know kramnik understands that he's clearly better here but it's one thing to understand that you are better and quite another to actually be able to <clears throat> find out how to sort of take advantage of this and now, now if you take here then cd4 is strong because i attack your knight on c6 so there's no time to win this even if you play queen takes e e4 i have a move like queen c1 and next up there is going to be some deadly discovered attack here so king g7 was played but now knight to d5 excellent move by kramnik and actually this is this is going to be just not great and he plays b4 gaining more space on the queen side white is playing on the entire board now and dubov just down to 17 16 15 seconds he plays take take and b5 but kramnik now has a one minute and 30 seconds in hand to figure out what to do queen b2 excellent move look at this queen eyeing the king there are one two three four pieces in between but they will move away at some point knight at seven one piece is moved away eight seconds left for daniel dubo i think it's time to move one more piece out of the way now there are only two pieces you see how kramnik's move has proved to be amazing by the way just so that you know if you take here then after b5, e5 would fall. So that's the reason why king g8 was played. He took knight takes d4, knight takes, pawn takes, queen takes. He goes rook b8, rook c1, rook b7, b6 played. Is that the pawn sack that he will make? Yes, he will. 144 heartbeats per minute for Kramnik, 139 for Dubov. Knight takes b6 is... Kramnik going to convert this. He's a pawn up. He's completely better. Knight d5. Rook b8. And he pushes his pawn to b5. Ah, the idea is if you take here, I can fork you. So queen e5 played. But now I can just take, take and push the pawn to b6. Exactly. The knight then defends this. And all is well. All is well. King uh, g7. His plan is to come here. I guess you can just enter rook c7, but you can also play rook c6, stopping knight f6. I think that would be a better move. Yes, Kramnik finds it. He's not the one to miss such moves. And now you can double down here with rook c1, or you can go rook a1 with the idea of rook c7. Sorry, rook a7. Knight e6 played, but now rook a7 should, should be good. first moves is king away again prophylaxis knight f4 maybe g3 ah he'll take on d5 sorry the knight is being attacked so rook a7 yeah rook a7 perfect move because if you take here i'll first take on b7 and then take on uh d5 oh he lost on time daniel dubov has lost on time kramnik has won and the score is now 1-1. Vladimir Kramnik showing that he is not the one to be taken lightly here. Another match goes into the Armageddon. Great game by Kramnik in a must-win situation. Let's go back to our commentators in the Berlin studio. I watched that Bruce Willis movie called Armageddon last night because I missed it so much. But today we get two of these. Let's have a look at the highlights of this game. This is already the stage where it is more or less decided. Kramnik dominating here with the knight on d5, pushing his b-pawn. Yeah, and uh, here we can see the trade. And there you go, b6. That pass pawn has been solidified. It was just complete advantage for Kramnik. Yeah, I guess we'll see one more clip of the final stages. Rook to a7 and watch Dubov's clock. His situation is hopeless as well. He takes, but he does it too slowly. And he claims his own defeat there. Ooh, ooh, Kramnik ooh. would have just have taken the knight and then went on to win. Yes. Rook end game.
And we are 50 seconds away from Armageddon. And white will have five minutes and is in a must-win situation. Black will have four minutes and has draw odds. There will be no increment whatsoever. What you see on the clock is what you get. And who do you think has the psychological advantage? Kramnik or Dubov? I think Kramnik has a psychological advantage because he just came back, won the second game. But Dubov might have the speed advantage in the end, although it didn't look like it when he lost on time there, but his situation was so desperate. I'm a bit curious. I heard both players had very specific questions about the rules of the Armageddon, what happens when someone doesn't move cleanly, um, how do you call the arbiter and so on. So, of course, we hope for a clean game. But some pieces flying. Off we go, guys. This is going to be amazing. Because Vladimir Kramnik has four minutes, Daniel Dubov has five, must win for Dubov. We have the Italian once again, but this time not with D3, but something much more concrete with D4. Pawn takes, pawn takes, check, and generally the line would go Bishop D2. You take, take, and then an important move D5 would be played in such positions. By the way, Abhijit, thank you for your super chat. He asked which Indian GM would be the next world champion. Well, difficult to say, but I think we have good number of players who are doing exceedingly well and they all have good chances. I can tell you some of the names which I think are doing very well, Castles, but let me do that uh, very shortly. By the way, here black is just doing very well. Uh, you can go 97, c6. Well, white also has his trumps here because he has the bishop pair. So actually not a bad opening decision by Dubov. Abhijit, the people who I think are very, very strong and can become future world champions are Gukesh, um, Arjun, Nihal, Prague, Raunak. There's Vidit, there's Hari, there is Leon, Pranav. So, a lot of talents here who are doing very well. H6, he brings his rook to E1. And now Bishop E6 played by Kramnik. Kramnik has 3 minutes 16 seconds. Dubo has 4 minutes 6 seconds. I like how Kramnik has played this game and also Dubo uh, has chosen a very interesting opening with this move knight d2 just to point out that if you play knight e4 then d5 leads to some crazy complications 6 rook e1 bishop e6 he goes bishop b5 he wants to take here on c6 and spoil your structure a good way could be knight c e7 and followed by c6 but also possible is knight d7 so that you can put your bishop on d5 and he plays his knight to d to e7 zwelop says i feel like kramnik will definitely get flagged not so sure not so sure see let's see He goes bishop to f4 here. Yeah, bishop f4 played. And Kramnik has 2 minutes 57 seconds. He has actually managed his time so well. With black you start with 1 minute less. But now he has equal time as Dubov. Which means a lot actually. Bishop g3. Now maybe 97. Ah, but then this is hanging. So maybe you go bishop d5 defending here. That is exactly what is played. Knight e5 played. Knight takes e5. By the way, here was a cool move. Bishop takes g2. King takes and then queen d5 check winning. The bishop on b5 loose pieces always drop off lpdo keep that in mind de and he plays c6 here bishop goes back to d3 and 
queen comes into g5 maybe an idea could be h5 h4 he goes bishop c4 offering to trade the bishops i think rook a d8 is a very very natural move to be made here and kramnik of course plays it whenever there's a very natural strong move it's very rare that kramnik does not spot it that's his chess education and chess upbringing he's very very solid in finding these moves queen b3 he takes on c4 rook takes c4 and uh, already h5 looks good queen d2 attacking the rook on e1 now white has to be careful how to deal with this two bows heart rate is quite high 147 kramnik is trying to keep it all together with 133 rook e4 played maybe rook d3 Queen d5. Queen d5. What was the move that Dubov is thinking about? Queen d5, he goes queen a4, b5, queen c2, queen e6, rook. Uh, h4 rook b5 h5 knight e7 the knight is now being rerouted to f5 keep in mind that kramnik has only a minute dubo has one minute 30 seconds Knight jumps to f5, hitting the bishop. All of a sudden, this position is really bad for white now. He plays queen c3. He says that this is already defended. Takes. Rook, e, rook d8, rook e3 c5 played by kramnik he's playing really well has 47 seconds daniel dubo has 53 seconds 50 seconds there's no increment everything now hinges on these last couple of minutes king h2 played kramnik irrespective of the time on the clock is clearly better here see He pushes his pawn to c4. He may want to go rook d3 at the right time. Goes queen a5, a6, queen to c7. Now rook d7 pushing the queen away. And by the way, Kramnik okay with the draw. So he's just moving uh, back and forth. Queen f5, c8, queen c3, queen f5. Queen goes to c7, d7, queen, b6, rook d2, a3 played, queen goes to g4, there's a mate threat on g2, the rook comes in, queen takes f4, e6, and he takes here, oh my god, he's found a way to draw, it seems he had very little time. And it seems like Vladimir Kramnik has found a way to hold this. No, he needs to make he needs to make a move. He needs to play quickly. King G3. Three seconds. Who's gonna lose on time? One second and 
Dumo loses. Wow, look at his king just flies away. Daniel Dubo loses there and Kramnik has managed to win it. Wow, Kramnik beats Dubo. It's a big result. Big, big result. And that too with a great game. Look completely winning, well, had a bad position and 22 seconds versus 13. But then he started looking for a checkmate and he started burning his time trying to find that checkmate. And then one second each. And uh, he... We don't want that. Give us a final 10 <laughs> seconds. Yeah, boring position, blah, blah, blah. Black is fine. <laughs> Black is more than fine here. And uh, we see Dubov there, you know, wow, what a game. And here we see the closing. Here we are. Moments 22 seconds versus 12. I mean, this should be a piece going of cake. For the Look at sacrifice. this beautiful move. But now he missed that the queen can step into the way, queen g1. So it wasn't so easy to checkmate and all hell broke loose. There he is. And there we see the crown being saved by this repetition of checks. And just watch as the clocks tick down, both seconds matching each other, second for second. Oh. Let's see where the pieces start flying. One second each. And Dubov, and Dubov taking the rook with a... Yeah, that was. <laughs> that was a bit. <laughs> he was trying to, to go the, the other way. I don't think his appeal will be successful here. So I, I don't know if he did a, did an appeal, but it looks like Vladimir Kramnik is our winner. Yeah, and uh, winning with a comeback win, and also winning in the Armageddon by one second to spare. Whew. And uh, okay, let's have a look at the highlights. Are there more highlights? That was already too nerve wracking. <laughs> have you ever seen something like that? And uh, let's check out some small highlights. And time to mention one of our partners, Kaspersky. As a technology and digital privacy company, Kaspersky supports the secure advancement of chess in the digital space and its expansion into online tournaments. A perfect combination of human excellence and strong technology. We're almost at the end of today's show with these two Amargetti. I think that's the plural. We have to look what happens tomorrow because tomorrow I think it's the, the lower bracket. Let's not call it the loser's bracket because these guys, they are not losers at all. What do we have? Well, we have elimination day as we say goodbye to some of our players. Vidit will face off against Yu Yang Yi, whereas Katikin will also meet Daniel Dubov, who is the highest rated player in this tournament. That is going to be absolutely insane. And uh, well, that was an exciting day of events, but we'll take a breather and we will see you tomorrow, same time, same place.